Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. Hey everybody, thanks for joining me on this episode of MindShift Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Clint Haycock. I'm really happy to be bringing you this episode today. This is a conversation that I had with author Ronna Russell. A couple of weeks ago, we did this recording, and it's about her book, The Uncomfortable Confessions of a Preacher's Kid. This is something that's just come out recently. You can check out her book on Amazon. You can also buy it through my Amazon affiliates page on my website, and the links to that are in the show notes as well if you want to help out this podcast a little bit. But it's really cool to talk to Rana because even though, yes, technically, this one's not necessarily about the world of the cults, which is something that I've been focusing on a lot lately, we do get into that issue kind of later on in the podcast, especially around this thing about the evangelical purity culture, and in her story, which he's going to tell you in just a few minutes. And what I found is really amazing about Rana's story is that not only has she experienced all this stuff growing up in evangelicalism as a kid, now she's a grown woman having gone through all these really pretty tough experiences that she's going to talk about in a little bit here. And this was making me think something that I actually tweeted this morning and then I got a lot of responses on it. What happened was I was actually re-listening to my bonus episode that came out this last Sunday and I was talking about the uh, Robert Lifton's Eight Markers of Cults and trying to relate that to evangelicalism. And as I was going back, I was actually driving on my way to work the other day listening to this episode again. It struck me that something he said was quite fascinating. He said that when you walk away from religion or a cultic experience or a group with undue influence, or in my case, evangelical or fundamentalist Christianity, there are three really important factors to keep in mind. Now, this is this relates to people who joined the religion or the cult later on in life. Maybe they were a teenager or an adult. He said there's three really important factors. The first one is how much of your identity were you able to retain as you went into the religion? How much of that were you able to preserve? The second factor is how much information leaked into the group from the outside in other words, contradictory information or information that made you question your faith or your beliefs. And then the third element is how much capacity do you have left over after you've left the group for self-renewal? And that obviously relates to the first two factors. And I tweeted this out this morning. And one of the things, in fact, Rana was one of the people who asked the question. She said, yeah, but what happens to those of us who were born into the religion or into the cult. And that is a critical thing because those of us like myself, I was born into fundamentalism. I was born into the evangelical Christian church. So therefore, it's a completely different sort of trajectory of deconstruction as well as reconstruction because the fact is we didn't have a pre-religion self. We didn't have a pre-religion or pre-cult identity. We just believed it as true. We were raised in it, so that's all we knew. And that was our worldview. That was reality. We, were, If you were like me, raised in the church or raised in a cultic group, that's all you knew. And so you never really had a pre-cult or pre-church identity that you could point to and say, that was the person I was before I adopted this belief system. And now that I've left it, I've got to go back and recover that original identity. Well, for those of us that were born into it, persons like myself and Rana, we've got to go through and go, okay, who the hell am I? What sort of identity do I actually have? And I've, I've been asking myself the same question. And this is something that we get into, I guess, a little bit in this conversation with Rana when we talk about what was that sort of person before. And maybe this is something that you can reflect on, especially if you were like myself or like Rana in hearing her story. It's a very powerful one. This is something that hopefully can help you process through your own journey. And I've been, like I said, I've been hearing a lot of comments on Twitter today. So it's very interesting to see where people are coming from, especially those of us, as I say, like myself and like Rana, who were born into religion. And that's all we knew. And so there can be a lot of anger. There can be a lot of betrayal. There's a whole different journey kind of recovering 
that adolescence that we never really had. And so for me, I've gone out in my you know late 40s and early 50s. I've gotten full sleeve tattoos. I've grown my hair out. I played in rock and metal bands. And that's kind of my way of sort of, I guess, reliving that adolescence. And I don't know what your journey is, but hopefully this conversation with Rana is going to help you to kind of maybe put yourself in her shoes. Maybe you weren't a preacher's kid necessarily, but if you were raised in evangelicalism, fundamentalism, or in a cultic kind of experience where this issue of purity culture was a huge factor, you know, what happens when things don't go the way they're planned? And this is something that I'm going to be talking to Rana about in just a minute. Now, before we get into the conversation between myself and Rana, I wanted to make you aware of something that's coming up that's a really new thing. There's an exciting new BBC3 documentary series. Now, I spoke to this woman. Her name's Linda McCarthy. Now, they're going to be doing a show, a documentary series, exploring young people that is aged 18 to 30, their views on and their relationships with religion. What they want to do is they want to speak to a diverse group of young men and women from any faith, from any religious community. The only catch is they have to be based in the UK, but they don't need to be British. So if that sounds like someone you know, maybe someone you know lives in the United Kingdom, or maybe that's you, you can contact lynda.mccarthy at voltage.tv. You can mention my name. You can tell that you talk to me. That is a great BBC3 documentary that's going to be coming up at some point. They're going to be doing the filming, I think, this summer for it. So if you want more information on that, just let me know and I can put you in touch with Linda. All right, let's go on into the conversation between myself and Ronna Russell as we talk about the uncomfortable confessions of a preacher's kid. I'm here with Lana Russell. I'm so glad that we finally connected. I don't know how long it's been since we've been talking about doing this podcast episode. Months, Months. at least, hasn't it? We've been messaging on Twitter. Yeah. That's that's how we met, isn't it? We met on Twitter. Yes. And then, yes, I stopped you on Twitter. Yeah. And we chatted on Twitter. And then you've just come out with your new book. It literally just dropped, what, a week or two ago? Yeah, and, uh, 10 days. Yeah. Can you tell us what the title is? Yes, the title is The Uncomfortable Confessions of a Preacher's Kid. And that kind of says it all. I mean, the picture on the front of the book, I think, is it speaks volume, isn't it? There's a picture. It must be you. How old were you at the time? Was, I was uh, three or four. The look on your face kind of conveys so many emotions mm -hmm. as you're sitting there, kind mm -hmm. of sadness and grief and trauma. And I, I don't even know what the book is about without reading reading it yet. But looking at the picture on the front, I think, my God, this this poor girl. I don't know what she's gone through, but the picture says yeah. speaks a thousand words. Yeah, it does. And that, yeah, I'm very much an introverted person and I was an introverted child, of course. So I think that comes through is that aloneness of being in that world with, uh, you know, shoved into the spotlight uh, with no, no say. And uh, that's why I chose the picture. And it's also a little bit, you know, I got told that I was stubborn a lot and that I was a brat a lot. And those things are up. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, it all comes through <laughs> in the picture. So that's yeah. there as well. Well, maybe you could walk us through the story. I know we're going to get into your book at some point later on, but where were you born? Where were you raised? Can, can you walk us through the backstory sure. of what yeah. and then what led you to ultimately write the book? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great. Um, I am 52 years old. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. My father was a minister with the United Pentecostal Church, which uh, is still headquartered in in uh, St. Louis. Uh, he worked for uh, in the, their administrative offices, running different programs throughout his time there and kind of made a name for himself. He was sort of in the spotlight uh, all throughout my my early childhood. You know, one of the preachers on the platform, one of the speakers on occasion, although he wasn't a pastor at that point. He went from there to managing Bible colleges. So he ran one in Jackson, Mississippi, and then later in Portland, Oregon, and it, it, all within the confines of the United Pentecostal Church. So very closed, very closed society. Yeah, you were in that bubble, basically. Yeah, very much the bubble. You know, the the long hair and the no makeup and the no jewelry and the you know, you, you had to look the part. It was very important to look the part for everyone, but for preachers' families, doubly so, uh, any little infraction, you know, 
you're definitely in yeah. the spotlight, aren't you? Absolutely. Everyone is watching everything that you do. Yeah. That's so strange, though, isn't it? Upon reflection, I mean, you're just a kid growing up in this system. Why should you be any more spiritual than anyone else? Just because your father's a pastor. I mean, the logic doesn't necessarily make sense, does it? But yet, I understand that is absolutely the way it is. It, it doesn't make any sense necessarily, but the job is to. It's important to remember, I think, that it's a very misogynistic culture. Yes, it's very patriarchal. Incredibly, very patriarchal, top down. The job of the the preacher's wife and the preacher's kids, especially the daughters, I have two sisters, is to make dad look good. That's the role. Right. Um, so if you rebel, you, it makes him that, look good. That's, that's your job. You have to be an example. That's what we were told, you know, all the time. Is you, you're an example. You're an example. And as a small child, you don't even, you don't know what that means. But it, you know, you feel the pressure. I cannot even imagine that must not have been a very easy environment to grow up in. No, I mean, the message is that everyone is watching. Everyone is watching you. And they were. I grew up in the church. I wasn't a pastor's kid, but I, my dad was an elder. He played worship, you know, and he led worship and did all those. He was very much a leader. But I can always remember mm -hmm. in that churchy culture, you always heard the the thing about, oh, watch out for the preacher's kid. They're the most rebellious ones. They're the ones that end up going <laughs> sideways. And, you know, so there was always that mystique around, ooh, right. being a preacher's kid. You know, they were the ones that were going to be some of the more sneaky and rebellious. Was that kind of what right. happened to you? Or did you feel the pressure um, of all that system? I, the pressure was certainly there. The reputation of, of being a preacher's kid was pretty well known. Everybody looked at preacher's kids like they were going to be the wild children. And some of them were. And quite honestly, that was never my intention. Um, I was just lonely. You know, it wasn't, uh, I was never, I wasn't seeking to rebel necessarily. I was looking for a place to fit. Right. Uh, you were just trying to fit in. Yeah. I was just trying to find a place that felt safe, but like, there wasn't one. I, I mean, it wasn't safe. So, I, uh, you know, I'm not sure, I guess I, it could be said that I rebelled because I certainly walked away from it all. Um, but I never felt like it was a part of it. So walking away didn't really feel like leaving. To me, it felt like everyone had already left me. They abandoned I, you. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure, though, for a kid. Even just growing mm -hmm. up in church, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, all the purity culture nonsense and things like yeah. that. That's the religious right, trauma. Right. The things, mm -hmm. you know, you and I probably share in, in our evangelical experiences. I grew up in Church of Christ, but it was very kind of fundamentalist. I grew up under the Bill Gothard sort of cult thing, oh, you know, so right. I had a whole okay. nother backstory that kind of goes up, you know, down that road. So anyway, you're a preacher's kid. Now, was all the traveling around, was that part of the trauma as well? Because I'm imagining you're bouncing from place to place to place. That couldn't right. have been very stable either. No, it it wasn't. The early days were were more stable in that sense. We stayed in in St. Louis till I was about nine years old. Moved to Mississippi for about five years, and then we really started to bounce. So I went to three different high schools in three different states. Uh, we were all over the place, and that coincided with uh, my parents leaving the UPC, and um, you know, hit my dad kind of living a double life. He had he had. Uh, come out as gay to himself but not to and to his partner but not to anyone else so he was oh, right. he had a lot of secrets that he was running from um so we started we really started moving around a lot at that point i was going to say <laughs> now my father this is really interesting when you said he was leading a double life your dad see i found out my dad was leading a double life too but oh. not until just a few years before he died it turns out he was essentially a pedophile and he oh. was yet yeah, he was an elder in the church and all those things. He led a double life, but he got away with it his entire life. So unlike your situation, well, you were saying your dad came out to himself, but at what point did it you know become public? Well, um, I'm so sorry that, about your experience with your dad. That's yeah, it's very traumatic it, it's to very find out so late traumatic. in his life. That, but that is yeah. traumatic. Yeah, my dad. What we moved. To California, he had a position in a church, and he was leading leading his double life. And he got caught. Uh, someone he was seen. Someone in the church saw him. I think it was in a it was in a bathhouse. 
Right. So he got caught out in the act. He of, got. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, he, he got found out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then the person who saw him reported him to the pastor of that church, and and he was confronted. I'll never understand why he handled it the way that he did. He was essentially fired, but they they allowed him to pretend like he had resigned. Um, right. So the church covered it up essentially. They, the the story they released yeah, was that they did. yeah they, they he'd covered let it up. go for other reasons but they didn't mm-hmm. tell the truth about why yeah no. that, that's very yeah. common though it is isn't it I mean we heard the Andy oh, Savage sir. story last year wasn't it where the church covered it up and they let him resign mm-hmm. and oh he's leaving to go you know pursue other ministry opportunities right. across right. the country and right. they had a big farewell service for him and everybody cried and he left mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm. No, he'd abused this poor girl, and sh- she was silenced and shunned. So it happens all the time, unfortunately. It does. Super yeah. common. Yeah, yeah it it's, it's sad, but true. Then, so the church let him off the hook, her. essentially. Yeah, then they just don't have to deal with it, right? Right, just sweep okay. it under the rug, and off off he goes. He's he's now someone else's problem. But where is he going to yeah. go from there? Well, he, he moved to L.A., and he actually left the ministry and moved in. His partner moved to L.A. with him. Uh, the really horrible thing about that is that he did not uh, tell my mother. Oh. He, my mother believed the story that the church told. Right. So she bought the cover story. Meanwhile, she did. he's setting up setting up a new life in in right. L.A. with exactly. his new partner. Mm-hmm. And so she's she's still working as the church secretary, and no one's talking to her, and she doesn't know why. So he just disappeared and. Yep. She knew nothing about it. Wow, that's no, pretty she, devastating. She, On top yeah, of the story yeah. of the, the church. Wow, that's unbelievable. So what happened then? He's he's setting up shop in, in L.A., setting up a new uh, life. Your mom doesn't know anything. No, how so does, finally this... the, the pastor sits my mom down and he doesn't tell her the truth. He must have realized that she didn't know. He didn't he offer her any that. sort of support. He just said, it. we really want to. Uh, a husband and wife couple in this position in the in the church administration. So you need to move on. So she she did, and uh, my dad was still pretending to be an out of town husband to her. And finally, I told her I told her that dad was living with his partner, and she should probably get tested for AIDS. Wow, that's unbelievable. And, um, that was a hard conversation. I can imagine. Well, I can imagine I, really. Yeah, I was about what, 19. So you're still a kid, really, and you're having to talk to your Pretty mom much. about. It. So really, the church put yeah. her at risk as well. So did he. I mean, uh, I can't I can't even fathom what you know, goes on. It's a shocking story. I never thought about it that way. They did kind of contribute to her risk factor, didn't they? Well, if, if they knew a long time before, I mean, a question of how long did they know about what he was doing? But certainly he put her at risk without saying anything. He did. So what yeah. was the upshot of the conversation with your mom? I can imagine she was devastated. She was devastated. She did go to a clinic in downtown Sacramento, which was not the kind of place that she had ever been before in her life. She had a she had a test done and she told my dad that she had done it. And he said, yeah, oh, well, that's probably a good idea. So not very supportive. <laughs> not at all. And uh, that was the first time I think he told her the truth about anything. Uh, so she she moved, uh, she divorced him and got on with her life to her credit. It was really, really difficult for her to say the least. It be difficult. But yeah. was she, was she not HIV positive then in the end? It sounds like she, she didn't. Was not. Right. So she, I'm yeah. sure she was relieved because what, what time, when was this? This must've been what? Uh, late seventies, early eighties. Eight, eight. Right. So kind of during the big HIV AIDS thing. Yeah. And I mean, I can remember going through that period and it was the gay disease and that's what it was mm-hmm. kind of termed at first. And I can I can remember even the church saying, you know, well, you see, this is what happens. This is what the Bible talks about, you know, mm-hmm. that this is the you know due penalty of their sins and taking that moral high ground. Right. Right. So I'm sure Absolutely. you heard all those and arguments. My my dad did get letters to that effect on his deathbed. I'm sure he did. People in the church. You got what you deserved. You got what you deserved. Mm -hmm. So were you able to patch up your relationship with your dad at all? I mean, were you you kind of in the middle of the whole thing? I was in the middle. Um, I stayed in Sacramento. He got on with his life. He did die of AIDS later. But for a few years there, I was the only one who I had already 
walked away from church and didn't didn't care that he was gay. I think I had a just a broader perspective of people at that point. I didn't think that there was anything wrong with being gay. You know, some people are just gay. Um, and that's how I felt about it even then. I was fine with that aspect. I didn't really know how badly he had behaved to my mother at that point. I mean, well, I knew. I knew yeah, a bit, but not the extent of it, not not the extent of it. And I still very much needed a parent. And so I did. I did have a relationship with him. I would go visit him in L.A. occasionally and and, you know, feel like I had a, a tie there. I had someone who would act as a parent, at least on occasion. My mother, frankly, was saving herself and rightly so. That's what she needed to do. I'm sure she couldn't deal with having a relationship. Well, did they ever patch it up, though, her, yeah. your mom and him? No. So he never, never apologized to her. They just literally went their separate ways. Yeah. I think she was up until the time that he died, she was always hoping that he would, you know, pick up the phone and 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 just say something. Just say anything. Just anything. make it make the effort to reach out. Right. But he never did. Why do you think he never picked up that phone? And made that call. That would have been the simplest thing to do, especially as he knew he was dying toward the end. He must have known, I don't have much time left. I need to make amends or something. He, I doubt if he gave her a thought. He literally just moved on. Yeah. I th- he was really self-involved. I don't think he yeah. I don't think he thought about her. My dad basically did the same thing when he died. He mm-hmm. you know, he took he took all of his secrets to the grave with him. I confronted him a couple of years before he died and insisted that he tell the truth about whatever he, whatever it is he had done, and he never did. You mm-hmm. know, he he was supposedly a Christian and all the rest of it. You know, so yeah, very self-absorbed, very self-protective. Yeah. I, yeah. I to this day, I'll, and I'll never know what he did. So you may never know either about all the stuff that went on. So it's unfortunate that it ended that way, isn't it? It is. It was a really sad, sad way to go. He. uh he died right before the medication that works. Yeah, it would have uh, it would have the- prolonged his life for sure, huh? Yeah. It was just he's one of the many, one of the many uh, sad stories. Yeah. Um, so, did your mother know? Well, that's part of the part of the journey is that I don't know the extent to which she knew. I, I have to believe she knew he was leading a double life for most of their marriage. To the extent, I don't know. But they, okay. she told me once that they never had a marriage. It was basically a sham the whole mm-hmm. time they were married. So oh. I find these things out much, much later on in life, you know. So I have no oh. idea. But they stayed together right till his death. She never left him, even though all this stuff came out. So, you know, oh. it's just the power of relationship, I guess, and, and money and things like mm-hmm. that. Comfort of life. I don't know. I, sure. I don't know. I don't have a relationship with her either because... Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I had to cut it off because it got so toxic. So yeah. that's the way yeah. that's ended, which I is a real it. shame. It is. Yeah. It is. It's what well, happened. I'm, I'm hanging in there with my mother. She's still around and I love her a lot. And the parts that I can't agree with or can't accept, I just set aside because life's too short to dwell there. So it is true. You can, can be consumed with anger and bitterness or, mm-hmm. or whatever. But let's finish the story. I'm I'm really yes. curious okay. to see here how this thing <laughs> So your okay. father well, passed away. Your mom's leading her bit. own life. And um, mm-hmm. where where are you in all this? Because you're saying you're kind of caught in the middle. It sounds like you were the only one who was able to talk to both parents uh, independently. Yeah. Obviously, they weren't yeah, talking well, to each other, but you're in the middle. Right. I had more of a uh, conversations with my father than I did with my mother at that point. She uh, she needed to put her life together, and 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 she did that, and then. Um, so I was a young adult living on my own and just trying to figure out, have you ever seen the, the television show, the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? The, yeah, I think so. The girl that has been in, you know, like trapped in a, in a religious cult in the basement and then she's released into the world. So it was kind of like that, you know, <laughs> it's just coming out into the real world. I'm an adult in the world and with absolutely no idea how to play that role. But I, I got along and I took care of myself. I got married. I was married for 22 years. We raised four kids. They're all adults now. But he, when he hit his 50s, um, you know, things were not okay. It was not a good marriage for a long time. And I finally, uh, finally figured out that he was gay. So my, my husband came out with my help. <laughs> wow. 
Um, Will, you're willing, and, willing help, or was it just you knew it no, had to happen? It. Oh gosh. That's obviously a long, complicated story. It is, and and there's some of it. You know, some of it's in the book, although I didn't delve too deeply into it because I can't tell his story. Yeah. I don't know why he didn't. He couldn't face his own sexual identity earlier in his life. He wasn't real raised religiously. So it wasn't that I think it was, you know, maybe just fear, but um, he's actually remarried to a man now and seems very happy and, and I'm happy for him. It's good for my kids to have a happy father. So that's all yeah. fine. So it's um, unlike your own, your own situation. Then what was some of that you're helping him to come out and get adjusted thinking, Hey, wait a minute. I don't want what happened to me to happen to my own kids. Is that part of the story? I forced him to face it. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. I would hesitate really to call it help. Right. It was more it was like, you need to do this. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. it's more like a shove out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shove him oh, out yeah, the nest. Cause, yeah. Cause I had been asking the question and, uh, and he was, he was not willing to face it. And then I actually discovered that he'd been going online. So, uh, so I confronted him and and that was it for me, but we got through it. The kids got through it. Everybody's, rebalanced now it was hard though oh i can imagine i mean i think that might be the difference between your parents and my 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 situation and what you dealt with because i'm sure my mom must have strongly suspected but she didn't have Mm -hmm. the wherewithal to do the confrontation until it was late and that's how it all came out was she she said to all of us kids i'm gonna tell them about what you're doing unless until unless you do and so mm-hmm. he was forced to kind of look kind of like what you did and it wasn't right. pretty either, you know, right. but that was like five years before he died. So uh, okay. I have no idea what was going on before that in their, in their marriage, but yeah, yeah. it's very, very messy mm-hmm. situation. So, yeah. So how did, how did you navigate through all that? So he comes out as gay with your kind of forcing him out the door. Yeah. yeah. What forcing. happened after um, that? I moved out and in the process of divorce, found out that, you know, he had run up tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt that I didn't know about. And uh, so I was living under the shadow of the the fear of bankruptcy constantly, because even though I didn't know about the debt, they could come after me for it because it had it had occurred during the marriage. Yeah, you're jointly responsible for it. Right. Even though I he, you know, hidden it from me completely. So, and it, you know, it all went to collections and, and, but they, they never did come after me for it. He took care of it. And, uh, I just worked, you know, I, I worked full time and I scrubbed office buildings on the weekends and did whatever I had to do to, you know, put food on the table. And, um, I worked really hard to, to try to take care of my kids in the, in, at the same time, I had been married to a gay man for 22 years and was, you know, really ready <laughs> to change that situation. So I went online and I, um, I played around. I, I met some interesting men and, um, had some fun and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm really not, I'm not ashamed to say that I did that. I think, uh, there, there's so much stigma to, um, you know, just, just needing sex for sex sake. Yeah, you but needed sometimes. companionship and partnership yeah. and, and all that all right. without a bunch of strings attached to it. Without any strings. You yeah. just have fun. Well, and, yeah. and coming out of the context of the religious repression, mm-hmm. you know, that's absolutely a no-no. You cannot have sex outside of marriage. That's, <laughs> you know, right. all the purity culture again. Yeah. And yeah, you're that's... you're being triggered by all this stuff. Did that play a factor in some of the the issues that you were working through though, once he'd left and you were, you know, single again with the tapes playing in your mind, all the things you heard growing up in church. No. Oh, really? So I you, you, so. you didn't, you weren't burdened by all this. Oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is oh, a, no. <laughs> sins against God no. and everything. No, no. I had a great time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could add, add another layer of guilt on top of everything else. That's just what you needed after going through yeah, all this. Right. No, no. Fortunately, that was long out of my head. Um, I did, I did not, did not have to deal with that. Um, I think, I think it's so important to be in touch with your physicality. And there's so much healing that can happen through physical action. I'm trying to not get dirty here, but, yeah. but, to, but to be touched. 
Yeah, especially if you haven't been for a when, long time. Right. When you haven't been, that fixes a whole lot of shit right there. Yeah, it's very healing. It can be. Yeah, just a contact. So that's yeah. a part of your own therapy, your own recovery. Yeah, absolutely. To feel desired, to have someone take me to bed and just let it be nothing more than that. Yeah. Um, that was a huge part of my healing. So that was a helpful phase that you went through. But I, I know you are now married because we yes. heard your husband <laughs> getting a snack earlier. And he's British. Yes. We heard that yeah. part as well. So he's from our part of the world over here somewhere. Yeah. Oh, he's from Stoke. He's not too far from me, about a little over an hour, hour and a half away from me. Right. Yeah. So not that far. Yeah. So how you, you're now married to this British man. Uh-huh. What led you then to write the book? I mean, you're talking about the com- uncomfortable confessions of a preacher's kid. What's the what's the confession? What are you confessing? Um, you know, it's a little bit of a tell all. I, I I tell the details of how I dealt with my own trauma. It's not a pretty story, and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I I want to say the word that this is what it's really like inside that cult. This is what they really do to children. This is what they really do to females. I think it's important to say those words. I know it's important to say those words because I get the messages from people thanking me for saying it out loud because they're too scared to. There are so many people who are living, talking about double lives. They are going through the motions of being a Christian because they know if they come out as atheist or as even questioning their faith, they lose their community. They'll lose their family. They'll be ostracized and they can't face it. It's heartbreaking. It's ex- they use, when, they, when they talk to me, they use the same language that uh, someone who was maybe a, they had realized that they're gay and they're scared to come out to their Christian family for fear of being kicked out. And that's a really common thing that happens to kids, right? Yes. In the LGBTQ community. So when I'm hearing from people who are using that exact same language that they're, I'm not out to my family. I'm not out to my community. I'll lose them. If I tell them the truth that I don't believe anymore. It's very, it can be very traumatic. I know my daughter, she's gay. And when she came out a few years back, she was terrified to tell certain Mm -hmm. family members who were very staunch evangelicals for that very reason, as you say. And when this podcast drops, she will have just gotten married. She's getting married yeah. to her partner. Um, and it's, you know, it's quite an amazing story. But we walked her through that with these mm-hmm. family members. And it was it, it worked out better than we had thought it might be or it might go. Good. Good. But it, I, I hear you. And I hear that terminology a lot where people say, I haven't come out yet. And you say, are you coming out as gay or what What are you coming out? You're of coming tr- out as atheist. <laughs> yeah. And it's obviously they're not you don't want to conflate the two because they are very different. But as you say, yeah. there's some commonality I've heard in in mm-hmm. not wanting to say anything. And it's the social cost, the loss of the social yes. network. That's yes. huge. In yes. both cases, you could well yes. lose relationships that's... with close friends and family, which is a marker of cults, as you say. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the similarity. That's the the place where those two issues really, really touch is that the fear of loss of family. And it's real. They're not wrong. They will lose. Oh, their- yeah, it absolutely happens. Mm-hmm. So in light of that, because I think that that is horrific, I'll say the words. Yeah, and if you'll it gives say somebody it. a little bit of courage, great. What have you heard from from in terms of feedback? When people say that, is it has it given them the courage then to go ahead and have those conversations and to come out, as it were, whether come out of the closet as gay or whatever, or coming out of, as an atheist or just someone who's questioning? Some, some has have. it given them that that power, that empowerment? Yeah, I I think that it it just helps them to know that it can be done. You can survive. You can survive. It's yeah. not easy, but you yeah. can survive. Not everyone gets back to me and tells me what they decide to do. But I do know I have one friend that I met that uh, was able to come out as both atheist and gay. I right. thought that was pretty great. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that takes know, some bravery. That's oftentimes, you know, part of the story. I, I just feel like I don't care who judges. I, I really don't. Yeah. I, I don't if care. You can't let that rule I you. Will, I will speak my truth because yeah. I know for a fact that it's 
that some people need me too. Absolutely. Well, and the thing I've I've uh, heard about recently is, you know, there's such an investment in us staying within the fold, whether it's the church mm-hmm. or whatever. Why are they so invested, emotionally invested in keeping us in this religious system? I wonder about it. It's almost like someone said, it's like their salvation is somehow tied up with mine. If I walk away, they're they're somehow in danger of losing their salvation. I mean, what's that all about? I don't understand why family members particularly, you know, they, they, oh, you just need to get back in church. You know, we're praying for you and, mm-hmm. you know, spouting Bible verses and all this. I mean, what's that right. connection? Well, yeah, I think those are really great questions and I'm not sure I have any answers. Um, there is the, the so-called, you know, love which I don't believe that that's actually what it is, but they, they call it love. They don't want you to go to hell. That's true. Um, they really believe it. I mean, they sincerely true, believe it. Oh, yes. Absolutely. I don't doubt their true belief. Oh, yeah. That's, that is sincere. I know that my, mother, my mother's heart is broken because I'm going to hell. And that makes me really sad for her. Yes, it does. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry that she feels that way. That yeah, must be really, really hard. It is. It's got to be. Yeah, and that, that's got to be part of that emotional investment, isn't it? And then I heard someone say that it, it's a it's a sense of betrayal. They feel sure. a sense of betrayal, like you know we were raised in this system and yeah. we were part of it. We were fervent believers and all the rest of it, and then we betrayed them and God, I guess, by walking away from the whole thing. Right. But yet, that this person said, I heard this on a podcast the other day, and they said the thing is the betrayal goes both ways because we also feel betrayed by them. They right. didn't do their due diligence. They were presenting all this stuff to us. It was it was true. It was all true. But no, it wasn't all true. They may have unwittingly presented it as true. I mean, they they sincerely believed it, as you say. But it, we found out later, wait a minute, you didn't do your homework, man. And I trusted you. So I feel betrayed right. by them, too. So it, it's a double whammy, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, yeah. it's a, lot of, a lot of deep hurt. And, you know, they, oh, yeah. they face... That there's any other way to see it, they they can't be wrong. Oh no, because God's involved in the whole thing, right? And it's all and true, it, and it's you know mm-hmm. the Bible's inspired and it's inerrant, and it's there's no mistakes in it, and on right. it's. A, I, I always say it's a, it's house, a house of cards. cards. It is a house of cards. I was just gonna say it. You beat me to it, but it is because their whole faith is built on this whole structure, and then you remove a couple cards, and the whole thing mm-hmm. comes crashing down, and they've it got always- nothing. This is why one of the things you're taught as a child from the very beginning is that you never question anything. You're not allowed to ask questions. You just accept and you believe it. Yeah, it's all true. It's is all that true. Why, is that why you say it's a cult in that sense mm-hmm. that you're indoctrinated, especially mm-hmm. if you're a second generation, you're born into it. Right. You don't yeah. have any choice. We just believed it all is true. Yeah. If if you If you're not allowed to ask questions... And have them answered. You're not allowed to have conversations. You're in a dangerous place. Not a good place. Right. And, you know, I was thinking about this, this very thing earlier today and that top down communication, the, the misogyny and the, the patriarchy, the, inabil- the patriarchy, the inability to have any questions answered or to have real conversations uh, about the beliefs or the, all the rules and the standards and, you know, the questions that any kid might have. That whole culture lends itself to an inability to communicate with any sort of emotional intelligence. You don't learn how to really talk to people. And that atmosphere lends itself to a culture of gossip and backbiting. My observations, you know, in retrospect. And and I see it play out sometimes even within my own family, you know, they're couple people in my family who are not super excited about my book, right? But they're not going to call me up and say, hey, what, I didn't know that this happened. Uh, can we talk about it? Or yeah, process uh, through. What, how did I fit into this story for you? Uh, can we talk about it? You, you don't get any of that. You get, there's the, the background conversations that are happening, but no one's going to pick up the phone and, and have a, a one-to-one with me. Which would and be I, really helpful, potentially. It could yeah, be for them really as well as you, that. especially if they did play a role in it. Sure. And I'm perfectly open to having those conversations. Yeah. But because they don't, deep down inside, they just don't want to hear it. They can't face it. Right. 
Well, it's interesting that you say that because, because of course, churches are known for the gossip and the backbiting and the backstabbing, yes. and it's just right. rife through churches. Every church I was ever a part of, right. whether I was just a, a Christian sitting in the seats or um, an elder or a pastor, uh-huh. it was terrible. And yeah. I want, I've never made that connection, but I've, I've definitely seen what you talk about when I'm re- as I'm researching the cults, this whole idea of you know identity suppression and the lack mm. of critical thinking and the loaded language, the Christianese, these are all markers of cults, but this yes. is what churches do. That's actually yes. designed to stop you from thinking critically. And what that does is it actually, you're questioning your own intellect, your own yes. sense of, hey, I've got a brain. No, yeah. I don't, I can't use my brain, not in the way that I really need to. And so, as you say, it's got to come out in other unhealthy ways. And so- <laughs> Here comes the right. gossip and the right. the backbiting, and so you're yeah. even experiencing it now, uh, having written the, your book. Yeah, that is fascinating. Yeah. It doesn't keep me up at night. That's good. Yeah, you, you could just Anyone yeah, you could eat you alive. Couldn't about it? it can do so, and sure. that's fine. Well, who should read your book? This is this is the question I'm thinking in my mind. What's the sort of profile? What's the person you're looking for that would be just absolutely perfect to pick your book up? There are actually a couple of different uh, groups, I think, that could uh, get a lot out of it. Obviously, the ex-Christians, uh, people who are raised in this environment and just want to not feel alone in it, you know, with yeah, it's empowering. Had this experience. And it really was that bad and it really was that crazy. So, you know, there's parts of it that are really pretty funny. I try to include a lot of humor, albeit dark humor, but it's there. Anyone who has discovered that their spouse was uh, gay and and has had to uh, walk through that, it's a it's a really difficult thing. It's a it's a deep betrayal. It's really painful to realize that after all this time, oh, you you never wanted me. You know, that's a that's a wound that's hard to heal. And and not an uncommon experience. And I would say that the other group that might gain some validation from my book is anyone who's ever gone online for sex. And nobody admits it, but there are millions of people online for sex right now. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Somebody, somebody's doing it. A lot um, of people are doing it. A lot of people are doing it. And yeah. uh, I think it's so easy to say that's a bad thing to do. That makes you a bad person. And it's so, so not that simple. It's obviously more complex and more nuanced, isn't it, than just saying, well, again, back in the but churches. There's so much shame around it in our right. culture. You know, there's, there's the one, you know, when, when Ashley Madison uh, ha- got hacked a few years ago, you know what website I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like a, it's a meetup website type thing. Yeah, it's specifically for, and uh, I was never on Ashley Madison. It was not my website of choice. It's a website for married people looking to play. Uh, Uh, They got hacked. And I don't remember how many thousands of people's identity was revealed. People committed suicide. Really? I didn't hear that part. Yeah. Several several men committed suicide after after, uh, that hack. And I thought, well, how much shame... There is in our culture around sexual need. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's just always okay to cheat. But uh, I am saying that our sexual communication is deeply flawed and lacking. Patience that we need to be able to have with each other when we're unhappy. Well, and then again, how much of it relates to the church teachings, religious teaching, not just Christianity, is it? I mean, other, other religions are very can be very oppressive around the whole area of sex, mm-hmm. you know, and look at the Catholic right. church, you know, celibacy for priests. Right. And I mean, right. come on, that is just, that's not a normal human desire. That's a it's powerful right. drive. And not yeah. only are you expected to be, to remain celibate your whole life, God is going to help you to do that. And of course that, that doesn't work. And right. so we're seeing a lot of things coming out of the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Horrifying <laughs> things. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I would love to be able to help shift the conversation uh, about sex to to something more open and um, and more understanding and, and maybe tone down the judgment just a little bit. You know, there are a whole lot of people stuck in sexless marriages. Dial it down a little bit. Dial it down. I mean, have yeah. a little empathy, a little understanding. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, how can people get a hold of you? That's a good oh. question. If people said, okay, Ron, I want to find out more about your book. Where, what's your best sort of contact uh, information for people? Um, I have a website, just ronarussell.com. Uh, that's my, my blog and uh, the books on Amazon. I'm on Facebook. I'm not hard to find. There aren't too many Ronna Russells out there. So yeah, you're not hard to find. Are you on Twitter as well? I'm on Twitter, but I'm sort of a Twitter failure. <laughs> you're a Twitter I mean, you failure. Can try, but <laughs> yeah, it's time consuming. I suppose like any social media, it's one of those things that can take up a lot of your time, can't it? Yeah. One of the things I found, though, is that it's a great way to promote your content online, you know, in terms of social media. To get to get mm. out there because there's a huge ex-evangelical community on Twitter yes. that, you know, I've connected with. I, I'm spending more and more time on Twitter. So my encouragement is, you know, maybe invest a bit more time in Twitter. I okay. don't know, but okay. it's worth I'll, it. I'll, uh, OK, I, I will try. You'll try. I, well, not for everybody. You know, it's not for everybody. And I I get probably easily discouraged. And I think some of that is just my age. You know, technology is, especially social media, is it's kind of a steep learning curve, especially when you venture out beyond just the talking to friends and you're trying to promote something. And um, you have to spend at least as much time interacting with other people and, and paying attention to what they're doing as you are promoting your own thing That's because true. give and take the, the social aspect of it, obviously exactly. because but, everybody else is promoting their stuff. And right, if right. all you're doing is promote, 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 then people yeah, aren't interested in it. There's a million right. other websites and books and stuff out there. So somehow right. you've you got to stand out, get on Twitter and just be that asshole. Right. That's just yeah, doesn't it's have the anything one. to say for anyone else. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think my age gets in my way a little bit there because it just seems like the whole ex-evangelical crowd on Twitter seems like they're all so much younger than I am. And um, um, so, it, you know, that's probably all in my head that it's you know, maybe maybe nobody really wants to hear what an old lady has to say about it. <laughs> don't say that, man. We're not, <laughs> we're not that far apart in age. I don't want to, you know, discourage <laughs> you. But I mean, I can Good. remember you know, it wasn't that long ago that mobile phones didn't exist. There was no right. such thing. Right. So. I tell my students, I teach, you know, 16 to 18 year old, generally that sort of age range at this college and mm -hmm. they all have mobile phones and they're addicted to their phones. Yes. And, you know, I say to them, when I went to college, cell phones did not exist. We didn't have them right. and they, they don't, right. they can't comprehend that. So yeah, the, the yeah. generation today, they are absolutely addicted to their devices, you know, so it's, a, sure. it's their first language really. Whereas you and me, we've had to come into it as outsiders. So, yeah, I, I understand. Technology is a second language. Yeah, yeah. And, but I'm thrilled for all of the younger people out there who are able to connect with each other. I, I don't know about you, but I spent decades not knowing that there were any other ex-Christians that I could even talk to. I wouldn't have known how to find them. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's hugely and, uh, empowering. It's really cool that they're able to. People can get involved with the ex if you just hashtag exvangelical or hashtag empty the pews or ex Christian. There's loads of different hashtags that the ex evangelical community uses on Twitter and other social media platforms. There's a huge community. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And no one's asking, well, how old are you? You know, so <laughs> they're, they're great resources. Sure. I'm really interested now to find your book. I mean, you sent me the link to the bio on your website, which I read. Now I'm going to have to go get your book and actually delve into it because, I, as we've seen, there's a lot of parallels between your story and whatever went on with my parents. There's a lot of yeah. unanswered questions. And that's yeah. part of the problem that I have is that I don't have any closure. My dad died mm -hmm. and he, like I say, he took all of his mm -hmm. secrets to the grave and he mm -hmm. obviously inten intentionally did that. And I don't know yeah. why. Well, I think he was protecting himself and whatever, sure. but, sure. Uh, you know, and he may have been gay. That was, that's the other part of the story. He may mm -hmm. have actually been gay, but my mom didn't do what you did until really quite late in the game. And so right. we've dealt with the fallout of that, you know, decision uh, or those series of decisions, you know, that went on for years. So, yeah, it's it's absolutely a real thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's well, I very hope tough. That you, I hope that you're able to uh, get your questions answered to the degree that you want them to be. I hope so. Well, it's yeah. a tough one because, yeah, I can't obviously talk to him and I don't have a relationship with my mom anymore. So mm -hmm. it's kind of we're left to pick up the pieces. And that's that's been my journey is part of coming out of the church and walking away from those toxic relationships in my family 
it's been mm -hmm. a double whammy, but it's been, it was the healthiest thing that I ever did. I had to do it. And it's, it's yeah. completely transformed my life. I feel like I'm a completely different person because I'm not all hung up on the bitterness and the anger and begging God right. for all the help that wasn't forthcoming. So I'm right. thinking I have to do this for my, I have to do this for myself and yes. get help for myself. Right. And so I and did. And that's, the, that's the power. That's the, that's the place where healing and power is. Yeah. When you, when you finally get up and say, all right, no and one's going to do this. Do this. Me. I've got to find some it. closure. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we find something that David Hayward said that struck me the other day on, on the podcast we did. He said, you know, people in the church, they're very good at hurting you, but they don't they don't see it that way because they're just blasting you with the truth. And then when you confront yeah. them and say, hey, look, you've, you've done all these terrible things to me. Well, I was just telling you the truth. Yeah. What well, You know, they don't even acknowledge that they've hurt you. And so right. there's no sense of closure again. You've right. got to go help yourself. You've got to provide yes. your own closure. Yes. So, yeah, these are very difficult yes. things for people to work through, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, nobody can do it. You you don't do it alone. I I think therapy is so important. Yeah, it's, it's critical. Really, it's really, it is critical to have a secular counselor, someone to just help you walk the road and think it through. Even if it's no more than, you know, you just have this place to go where you can sit in quiet for an hour and be heard. Yeah. No know? one else is listening. Yeah. Right. At least you're paying this person to listen. It's so important to do that for yourself. And it's true. I've heard he did something David Hayward said as well that he said, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to a Christian counselor, but you've got to be very wary of that because they may try to talk you back into the church. They may try to talk you back into believing again, or they're going to be counseling you from the Bible or something yeah. like that. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Wary. You said, yeah, you'd be very wary of that, wouldn't you? That. Yeah. Yeah. If they're advertising themselves as a Christian counselor, then that they're going to try to steer you that direction. And a lot of a lot of people that advertise themselves as Christian counselors aren't actually qualified. That's true. Yeah. They may have gotten some degree from some institution, but that doesn't mean they're right. really qualified. Well, right. their worldview is, yeah, they're coming at it from... I'm just going to quote Bible verses and, right. you know, the Bible's got all the answers, including how to fix <laughs> human psychological problems. <laughs> it's just, yeah. 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 Crazy sort of stuff. like being told to give your rapist another chance. They're really a good person at heart. You know, Yeah, that's not. Well, the Old Testament says hard. the woman's got to marry her rapist. You know, that's an actual law in the Old like, Testament. I mean, that's just, yeah, I can't get my head around that. No. Anyway, well, it sounds like I'm going to get your book for sure. Um, Thank you. you um, is there a way to get an autographed copy? See, now I've got yes. <laughs> to get, yeah. we we work this out so I can get an autographed copy. Absolutely. But. Just if you just go to my website, ronarussell.com, I do actually have a box of books and I will, Ooh. you know, take PayPal and Venmo and I'll send a, send an autographed copy out. Okay. Anytime. That sounds like a yeah. plan. If you and can do you know, that, that would be great. It's a, yeah, absolutely. It's a paperback. You know, it's not, it's not, it's less than 200 pages. It's not a big book. Most people read it in one sitting. Right. So. It's not like War and Peace or something like that. No, I'm not that deep. You're not that deep. Okay. <laughs> well, it sounds like a great resource anyway. Thank you so much, Ron, and for taking the time to talk to me. I've really enjoyed it. I mean, Good. it's made me now think about a lot of stuff. So now I've Good. got more Thank work you. to do. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Take care. I've said this many times before doing this podcast. One of the things that I absolutely love, and I never, of course, could foresee this when I started this almost three years ago now, doing this podcast was meeting such wonderful, amazing people like Ronna Russell. I have met so many great people as a result of doing this podcast, and it's quite funny because I really don't schedule things out. I don't have a big master plan, a big master agenda. It's funny because when I was the pastor of a church, we used to schedule our preaching for the whole year. We had everything mapped out. We knew exactly what was going on week in, week out, but I found that doing this podcast, I might have plans and things for 
guests that I want to get on the show and I message people and people message me. But that's what happens with Rana. She actually messaged me several months ago and said, I'd like to talk to you about my new book, this uh, Uncomfortable Confessions of a Preacher's Kid. And she sent me some things on it. And I thought, wow, this is just an amazing story. And in a way, it did kind of slot in with uh, with my conversation on topics around the cults. Because as Rana said, here she is grown up in this home that her father turns out to be gay. And of course, in the purity culture, in evangelicalism, especially, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this was just an absolute taboo. I mean, it's a big enough subject now. It's still a problem in terms of evangelicalism. They don't know what to do. Some churches are more open and inclusive. Some churches will say, well, we're inclusive. But what they mean is, okay, we won't discriminate against gay people, but our actual hope is is that they'll come in, they'll see how lovely and wonderful we are representing the love of God, and they'll get saved, and then God will actually make them straight, and they'll be a straight person instead of gay. You know, And obviously some churches are actually uh, affirming and inclusive. You know, so a lot has changed in the last 30, 40 years since Rana was a little girl growing up in this really kind of a messed up environment. And it's amazing, I think, what really shines through in the whole story of Rana's deconstruction as well as her reconstruction going through all these traumatic and really tough life experiences is that she's become this very strong woman. And that's an amazing thing. A lot of people, I guess, could have been destroyed by all these experiences that they had. Not only was her dad gay and it didn't really go that well, but then her husband turns out to be gay as well. And that wasn't a very easy thing to navigate through. And I'm glad that Rana has walked through all that stuff and you can hear the wisdom of of those years and the tough struggles that she's had, but she's worked through it and she's continuing to work through it. And that's what I say is I love meeting people like Rana. It's absolutely an amazing thing. So I love doing that. I, I don't know if it's helpful for you, but I hope Rana's story was a, I know it was a powerful one and I hope that it's helped you too. If you want to talk to me, I'm probably the most active platform you can reach me on right now is on Twitter. I'm very active there. You can follow me at MindShift2018. I will also put Rana's um, contact information in the show notes. You can get a hold of Rana. As I said before, you can go on Amazon and buy her book. You can also go on my website and I'll put the link in the show notes. If you want to buy her book through my Amazon affiliates page, that's a good way to support this podcast. The other way to do it is, of course, you can be a supporter on Patreon. We've had a lot of people. In fact, one really cool thing is that recently I've added Rana into our closed podcast Facebook group, and we've got a lot of uh, former guests in there. I speak to a lot of people on almost a daily basis, Janice Selby, David Hayward, you know, and Rana's now in there. So that's a really great way to connect with people that I've had on the show so consider becoming a part of the Closed Mindship Podcast Facebook group. Support this show on Patreon. And again, the links to that are in the show notes. Now, what's coming up in the next couple of weeks? Well, I honestly, I'm not sure because I've got so many great things in the works. I've been talking to John Atak. He's a former Scientologist who lives just a couple hours from me over here in the United Kingdom. So at some point, I'm going to be making a trip over there to the Nottingham area. I'm going to be talking to John. I've also got feelers out for an episode with Dr. Yanya Lalich, who is a sociologist, a cult expert, and former cult member herself. So that's coming up too. And I've also been talking a little bit with the guys from the How To Heretics podcast. We are still we still have yet to set a date for getting that together. I'm waiting for one of the guys to come back from his business trip. So that's coming up. Also, I'm still putting feelers out to talk to Dr. Stephen Hassan of the uh, Freedom of Mind organization. So again, I've got some fantastic stuff in the works. I'm not actually sure what's going to be coming out in the next couple of weeks. But hey, stay tuned. There might be another bonus episode coming. You never know. Oh, there is one other thing I wanted to mention too, and that is, as you know, if you listened to the show a few weeks back, I had Neil604 from Canada. We talked about getting together when I go to Seattle in July. There's a couple of things that have come out of this too, and that is, for one thing, we're going to be doing an ex-evangelical gathering probably on the 6th of July in the Seattle, the South Center area. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, hit me up because we're going to be doing a dinner and a gathering as I always do every time I go across to Seattle with the ex-evangelical group of people in the Seattle Pacific Northwest area. And then I'm going to be heading up to British Columbia 
on the 12th and 13th of July. We're going to be doing something with Neil 604 and as many people as we can get out on the 13th of July. So details have yet to be solidified on that, but we are planning something. It's in the works. So stay tuned for that. If you're in BC or again, the Pacific Northwest, come on up to Canada and check out the live event that we're going to be doing with Neil 604, the Canadian atheist. Thanks for joining me and Ronna Russell as we talked about her book, The Uncomfortable Confessions of a Preacher's Kid. Join me in a couple of weeks again for another great episode of Mindship Podcast. Podcast.